have uh, higher white noise uh, density, and they also tend to have often, it depends on how the designer did it, but they tend to have a bump or a spike or often at the higher frequencies they tend to have something that's going on that's a little funny. So, you know, you'll look at the spectral density plot and they'll, it'll be cut off at some low frequency. And, and sometimes the reason that it's cut off at that low frequency is because there's something funny going on at the higher frequency. So uh, just be aware of that, but that can be a very good option. Um, so that's, those are some ways that you can get around this. Uh, or you can go do, you know, use the more theoretical formula. But to be honest, it, it may be the best thing to just go check it out in the lab and see how it performs in your system. Uh, 1 over F noise does tend to vary a little bit more than white noise. So even if you're super accurate in your uh, calculations, you might find that in real life you've got a little bit of variability anyway. So we talked a lot about how to convert uh, spectral density, or nanovolts per hertz, into uh, microvolts RMS. So the next thing we want to talk about is how to convert microvolts RMS into microvolts peak-to-peak. -peak. So uh, in theory, your peak-to-peak -peak noise is infinite because you're looking at the outliers, and the longer that you look at the outliers, the bigger the min and the max will be. Um, however, in practice, Typically, the rule of thumb is to multiply the RMS by uh, 6 to get the peak-to-peak. -peak. And if you do that, you'll get 99.7% of the points. So you see here, uh, down below, we've got our, our picture of the bell curve. And you, you can see is as you go further out in standard deviations, you get more and more of the points in the bell curve. So if you go plus or minus 3 standard deviations, or 6 total standard deviations, then you get this 99.7%. Now. Other folks uh, say, no, that's not good enough. You need 99.9. .9. So if you want to do that, you can use 6.6 .6 standard deviations. Or if you wanted even more points, you could go figure out what the even bigger number is. So uh, uh, there isn't a, there, the point is there's not an exact number when you convert from RMS to peak to peak because in reality, peak to peak is not an exact number. So it's, it's always sort of an uh, approximation. All right, let's talk about how to do noise math. So the most important thing to remember when you're uh, doing uh, combining noise signals is that noise adds as the sum of squares. So if you're adding two signals, it adds as the sum of squares, and then you take the square root. Uh, so we've got a little example here of, let's say you've got two 100 kilo ohm resistors. Each of those have 40 nanovolts per hertz. If you were running those into uh, say an ideal instrumentation amplifier, a noiseless instrumentation amplifier, uh, then what you do is you just square each of those 40 nanovolts per hertz, uh, add them together, and then take the square root, and you get 57 for the total. The other thing that you'll typically be doing with noise signals is you'll be gaining them up or occasionally attenuating them, and that works just like standard math. You just uh, multiply or divide by uh, the gain or the attenuation. So we took our signal from our last example, and instead of using a gain of 1 in amp, we used a gain of 100, and you see that it's 100 times more. Let's talk about a couple of noise shortcuts. The first that we talked about earlier was that this 1 kilo ohm resistor equals 4 nanovolts per hertz, so you can quickly figure out uh, what the noise of different resistors are. Another shortcut that will save you some time is remember that when you add noise sources, the larger sources quickly dominate, and this comes from the sum of squares addition. So, you know, if you've got a noise signal that's less than one fifth, you can basically ignore it uh, because remember, if you've got two noise signals and one is one fifth of the other, because of the sum of squares, it'll actually end up the contribution will be one twenty fifth. Uh, so, because of the squaring property, quickly the smaller signal falls away. And then the next shortcut is that. If your first gain stage is large, you can typically ignore uh, the later gain stages. So let's say I've got a gain stage of 10, then my other gain stages are going to be a lot smaller than 10x whatever the noise in the front is probably. And so then I can use my second rule where we say, okay, we can ignore any of the small signals. So uh, that brings us to our tips. And the first tip is uh, apply the gain early. And it's just like what we said. If you can apply uh, as much gain in the front, then 
you don't have to worry about your selection of components or what resist you can you can optimize your further stages you know for lower power or whatever you want to do and not have to worry about figuring out what the noise is so we have two examples here of a two stage system uh, where we want to gain a 10 and in the first example we only have a gain of 2 at the front and if you only have this low gain at the front then the noise of your second stage can contribute to your total noise performance and so you'll get a bigger noise performance than the bottom one where we apply all your gain in the first stage and then the noise performance of the second stage doesn't really matter that much the next thing to uh, watch out for is your source impedance so uh, there's two reasons why the source impedance is important one is the actual source impedance of the sensor contributes its own noise and the other reason is that the current noise of the amplifier will interact with that sensor source impedance uh, and can cause uh, extra noise in your circuit so we've got a example on this next slide here so let's say you've been given a sensor and you find out that this 9 kilo ohm is this, uh, that it's got 9 kilo ohms of impedance in that sensor and your boss tells you okay we need as low a noise system as we can get here so you go do your due diligence and you look on the ADI website and you go through our amplifiers and you find these two amplifiers here and they're both really noi low noise amplifiers this 8699 and this 8675 and uh, you know, okay these are great these are really low noise about as best as I can find and I'm going to use these and I'm going to get you know really low noise out of this part well uh, and so now you need to decide okay which of these should I use and you look okay this one's got 1.1 nanovolts per hertz this other one's got 2.8 must be that I should use the 1.1 nanovolts per hertz but before you make that decision uh, you should do a little bit more thinking and research so the first thing that you want to do is figure out how much noise that sensor itself even with perfect amplifiers how much noise would that sensor itself have so if you do the calculation 9 kilo ohms we know take the square root of 9 multiply by 4 you get 12 so uh, without adding with perfect IC components amplifying the sensor the best you will ever get is 12 nanovolts per hertz you won't get any better than that um, so that sets your lower limit so you know that right off the bat you're not going to get anywhere near 1.1 or 2.8 uh, the next thing to do is set up your circuit the way you want and what I've done here to make it easy is I've just said okay we're going to apply a lot of gain because uh, this is our first gauge state so we want to apply as much gain as we can so we're applying a gain of a thousand and then I've used pretty low value resistors so that they don't their noise doesn't really contribute to our uh, calculations but we do what we do need to look into is the current noise of these different amplifiers so if we go look in the data sheet and and you know unlike the uh, nanovolt per hertz number that's prominently displayed on the features on the front page you actually got to go flip it through a few pages to find the current noise spec but we'll find that the uh, 8599 has 2.3 picoamps per hertz whereas the uh, 8675 has a much lower current noise number and if you actually go do the math and multiply that by the 9 kilo ohms you find that 2.3 picoamps per hertz has a very significant contribution to the total noise of the system so it's 20.7 uh, so it's it's big compared to everything else we've been talking about so in the final analysis when you add up all the signals together you find out that uh, the 8599 even though it's this really low noise 1.1 uh, nanovolts per hertz has much higher noise than the other option uh, which is uh, you know when you first saw it looked okay it's a little bit bigger noise but if you actually go do the math because of the current noise uh, the total noise is much less so just watch out for your sensor impedance both because it sets a lower bound and also watch out for uh, your current noise of your different amplifiers how it interacts with that sensor and then the third thing to watch out for if you're doing really low noise design it's for kind of you know medium level it doesn't matter all that much is uh, the no the size of your resistors your feedback resistors so if we look at a model of our uh, non-inverting configuration with feedback resistors we'll see that uh, we've got these two voltage sources 
And if you look at what those voltage sources are, uh, you'll see that the RF resistor, the resistor in the feedback, looks like a voltage source at the output, uh, whereas the RG resistor looks, at least in kind of inverting configuration sense, a uh, voltage at the input. Uh, and the key takeaway from this is, is that if you have a high gain, which is what you should do if you ha uh, have this at the front stage of your system, is that your RG resistor dominates. So just watch out for that. And the other thing to watch out for is when you have high resistance values, again, watch out for your current noise, which will flow through those resistors. Okay. So we talked about quite a bit today. Uh, let's summarize. So the first thing we talked about was the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic, what I called extrinsic noise or uh, interference from other sources and how you need to watch out for that interference and design your circuit to uh, not be susceptible to that interference before even worrying about this intrinsic noise stuff. Then we talked about the three main sources of intrinsic noise for most folks, which is resistors, amplifiers, and ADCs. You can certainly see noise from other things like references uh, or D-to-A converters, but for most folks, these three are the main contributors. We talked about uh, the different ways of measuring noise and how to convert between these different method methods and units. We talked about some noise math, how to both add noise, which you added as the sum of squares, uh, and then multiplication, which is just like normal. And then we talked about some tips, and the main tips are uh, apply as much gain as you can at the front, and then watch out for uh, your resistance, both your feedback resistors and your source resistance. ADI has a lot of information on noise. We only really scratched the surface today. If you like the webinar format, uh, Reza Mogimi has given a three-part series on uh, noise optimization. We've also got a nice app note, uh, app note 940, and there's another one, oldie but a goodie, the 358. And then I could recommend the uh, tutorial, the 48, if you want to understand more about how to convert between these different uh, noise methods. That's a pretty good, pretty good tutorial. This is me. This is my phone number. If you have questions, uh, feel free to contact me at that phone number, and I'll see if I can answer them for you. Thanks. I'll give, it, I'll give uh, this back to Patrick now.